very much um, for um, this great evening with all the thunderstorm and everything. Oh, right here. <laughs> um, um, we have a great uh, special privilege to have two speakers on the opening night for the 2018 Science Teacher Workshops. And I was very delightful to have two great speakers here. We have Craig Percy and Joyce Connery trying to do the first time uh, giving a talk um, that very significant provide impact on nuclear energy and policy side. So they both are expert in this area. Um, so with Craig have been monumental at the Washington being our uh, public speaker and then provide a lot of direction. Even one of the starter of the NEUP, which is one of the big grants supporting DOE and um, Department of Energy for the university program to excite that whole arena of uh, research. And then turn that to a side, we have Joyce Connery, very strong um, speaker in, in the sense of all the public policy and re regarding to nuclear energy. And she, she was actually on the Obama as an um, advisor, correct, if, if I'm correct. And now she's also still staying on board with the um, Defend Nuclear Facility Safety Board. So having both of them would provide very significant impact and hopefully will give you an opportunity to learn more. And feel free to ask any questions. Would you, would you prefer to have them interact with you with questions? Or? I think we have a few places in the presentation where we can stop and, and ask questions. Okay. So we're gonna kinda go in sections. That would be awesome on that particular part. So having said that, I'm gonna turn over the floor. I'm gonna change the PowerPoint for them and then let, let them grow. Great. Thank you. Craig, do you wanna start with your disclaimer? Yes, so um, I'll do this for, uh, for both of us and you can clean up if I get it wrong. Um, so uh, the views expressed this evening, especially to you people out there, um, are the views of our own, and they're not necessarily reflective of the institutions that we work for, so please uh, take that into consideration as we, um, um, as we talk with you this evening. Um, my name is Craig Piercy, and I'm the Washington representative of the American Nuclear Society. So um, I interact, I'm the liaison between ANS and really the nuclear engineering community, at least those that choose to pay their dues, and, uh, and the executive branch, the legislative branch, and then also non-governmental organizations in Washington, D.C. Um, Joyce? So I'm Joyce Connery. My current position is uh, on the board of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. Uh, and again, as Craig said, uh, these are my own. I'm not speaking for the administration, and I'm not speaking for my board. Uh, I am a, a partisan appointee at this point in time. Uh, because I was appointed by uh, President Obama to the current position I'm in, it's a term position, which is why I'm still in it. Uh, but in my previous iterations, I was a civil servant and I worked actually in the White House for both the Bush and the Obama administrations in the areas of nuclear nonproliferation, nuclear security, nuclear energy, and nuclear safety. So it's kind of a, a spectrum of uh, policy topics, not physical. And, and, I, and I'm totally not a physicist, uh, you know, a political science uh, person by background. I spent, uh, it's been now about 20 years working in nuclear policy. I spent 10 years on, or roughly 10 years on Capitol Hill, uh, working for um, m members of both the House and the Senate. I spent a good long time uh, working for a member who was on the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, so we handled all of the money for nuclear energy programs. And I've been the Washington representative since 2005, so I'm in my 13th year. And, and so, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you to SUPI and the, the, the department and Virginia Commonwealth University for doing this. It's really important. Um, I think we do a lot of talking in our daily lives, and, and it's, it's good to talk to people that really you know, have the responsibility of passing that information on to a new generation to help them really understand what this technology and what this science is all about. Um, I think most of our conversation today will not be, really none of it will be about science or very little of it. Um, we're gonna talk about policy, we're gonna talk about broader trends, we're gonna kind of give you that large, you know, hopefully give you that larger uh, perspective about nuclear energy and its relationship to the world. Um, and we've not done this before, so this is very much an experiment right now. 
but what I'm going to do is, is I've sort of divided the slide presentation into uh, three sections. Uh, the first is uh, why I love <laughs> nuclear energy. The second one is where nuclear energy is in this country today and where it could be tomorrow. And then broaden out a little bit and talk a little bit more about the world and the global significance of nuclear energy. Um, Joyce, you know, we, we call the two sides of the same coin. So uh, in a way, I'm sort of the, the advocate for the technology. So I spend my time on Capitol Hill or in the administration or with other nonprofit organizations, think tanks, talking about nuclear energy really as an advocate for what it can do. Um, Joyce is, is focused more on the nonproliferation end of things. And so it's more about, you know, to a certain extent, it's, it, what we're going to talk about today is more about the intersection between the, the possibilities and the responsibilities related to nuclear energy. How'd I do? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I've, I'm more the pragmatist, so, so the advocate, and Craig has actually come to me in my government positions with um, advocacy for the American Nuclear Society, advocacy for the community at large, and I take that, as a policymaker, take that information and I weigh that against all of the other stakeholders, uh, some of whom are from the nonproliferation world, some of whom are from the security world, commerce, defense, who have a little bit different perspective on nuclear. So, um, so Craig provides the advocacy piece of it, and I'm the cold rain shower of reality <laughs> as to <laughs> why we can't do what he wants to do or how we find the, the middle road that's actually going to work with the policies that we have. Right. So, and hopefully you didn't dismiss everything that I brought to you when you were in the Obama White House. No, no, actually right. we worked together closely and we got some good things done. And we did, um, we did a lot of trade missions, actually worked on nuclear energy policy um, but for the White House and trade policy. So Craig and I have gone to the International Atomic Energy Agency and to, um, and to countries that are looking to expand nuclear power to talk about advocating for our domestic nuclear capabilities. So, and, and how they can be exported abroad. And my children are all products of Virginia schools, so thank you. Uh, I know what you're going through. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> and take it away, Craig. Excellent. Well, so uh, let's start by, uh, there we go. Let me, let me haul a little bit of mail here. Um, so uh, American Nuclear Society, so basically the main uh, professional society in the United States um, representing skilled nuclear professionals. So people, a lot of nuclear engineers, but also other uh, sorts of technologists and, and, and a few policy. <laughs> um, 11,000 nationwide, uh, roughly evenly split between um, industry, universities, um, national laboratories, and government agencies. So, are you still a member? Of course. Okay. I'm on your committee. Good, good. <laughs> Um, all right, and then we also have 10 more members that are members of the national organization but participate in local sections. Nicole is chair of the Virginia section back there. Uh, we, have, we have sections like that all over the country. People that get together once a month, hear speakers, work together, do charitable works. And then we also have local sections all around the world. So what I want to do today is, I, I, you know, I'm going to start by talking about why I love nuclear energy. We're going to stop. We're going to talk a little bit of, you know, We'll, we'll have some time for questions, but these are mostly visuals, but let me, let me sort of, this really in a way is why I love nuclear energy. So this, this box here, you can see the little human and the house. This is a million barrels of oil volumetrically. And we use, in this country alone, we use six or seven of these a day. Um, this right here, this little block out by the front porch, is the energy equivalent of uranium-235. So for the same energy that you need, seven of those blocks every day, the same energy is in this uranium-235. Now that's an oversimplification. Obviously, you've got to be able to find a way to meaningfully use it. But just to give you a sense of the pure energy density of nuclear, it, it, it's unlike anything else. And, and you know, th that's why a lot of people get into the field, they see the potential, the scientific potential of it, um, and, and I think that's the reason why you can't ignore nuclear, whatever you know, your thinking is about how much energy we may use in the future or in what form that energy should take. Um, 
So just to give you an example, so I, I sort of put this ring down here at the bottom. Um, this is basically the, the approximate footprint of a Westinghouse AP1000, which is sort of the modern generation three plus reactors, about 1100 megawatts. Um, this, is, this is a 1.1 uh, gigawatt energy footprint in wind. And if you think about the fact that nuclear is on, generally the capacity factor for nuclear is roughly uh, it's, it's, in the United States, it's been consistently over the 90% mark for the last 10 years. They're pushing 92, 93%. You know, all the outages in the plants are planned hour by hour, minute by minute. You know, you, you sort of compare that to wind at 32.5. At Imagine that previous slide, I'll go back to it. Technically, to get the same energy, you need three of these and hopefully in different places where the wind blows eight hours each day so that you can get the same amount of energy out of it. And you still need gas generation in order to make up for when the wind doesn't blow. Exactly, exactly. So uh, right now, this, this number is down a little bit from, from when this slide was put together. It's kind of right about 60% now of our clean energy electricity generation in this country is provided by nuclear. So it still is and will be for the foreseeable future the, the largest single piece of the pie when it comes to clean energy generation. And how many reactors is that, Craig? This is uh, right now uh, 99 reactors. Actually, this may be 100 or 101. It's gone down a little bit since then. But out of 100 reactors, that's, that's what you get. Um, so I, I want to put this out here because Look, there's no free lunch. I want to get this out of the way first, right? Let's deal with the, the messy facts first, and hopefully we'll find the greater truth as part of this process. But, you know, there is no free lunch. And nuclear, with everything that's happened and all, you know, the things that you've heard about, um, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, still, you're talking about the lowest amount of, you know, loss of life per terawatt hour generated. So. We can talk all we want about relative safety. The record speaks for itself. Nuclear really is the safest. I mean, you know, again, solar and wind, you know, you're down here in the, you know, you're down here in the, the, you know, the margin dust of a statistic because people fall off roofs, you know, turbine blades <laughs> fall apart and, and you know, uh, um, have catastrophic failures and kill, I mean, you know, there is, there is no, there is no free lunch. And the other thing I like, you know, you always hear about, and when, when you hear people talk about nuclear, invariably the first question is, you know, what about the waste, right? I'm just saying you should use maybe a local. Yeah, this was the best picture. <laughs> I'd love to get a good more. I had the right perspective, you know. Um, so, you know, I mean, look. The, I was going to say the N stands for knowledge. Sorry, how you for asking. It stands for nuclear. There we go, Sue. That's it. Um, so if you think of all the waste ever generated by every nuclear plant in the United States, every civilian nuclear plant since we started in the 1950s, you took all of that waste without even reprocessing it or doing anything else to it and stacked it up, it would all fit on this field roughly up to the goalposts. So when you hear people say about what about the waste, the fact of the matter is from a volume challenge, it's small. Is, is there an engineering challenge involved? Yes, there absolutely is. There are no showstoppers there. Are there political challenges to nuclear waste? You bet. And we can talk about that as long as you'd like, and we can quote a chapter and verse on the history, but you know, if anything, that's the, that's the problem. But again, you know, politics is downstream from culture, and so, you know, we have to, and, and you guys are really at the front lines there because you're teaching people that are forming their opinions for the first time, right? By the time we're talking to them, they already have, and you know, very firm, concrete opinions about things generally. So, um, and he's not advocating actually putting waste in a football field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, right, exactly. Now I think Oklahoma might like that. But, uh, um, okay. But, uh, so, but I think what keeps what keeps I think me and a lot of other people, um, you know, solid about nuclear energy, even when the bad headlines come, are the fact that the men and women that work in these plants um, are some of the most, I mean, you know, they are the Chesley Sullenbergers of this industry. 
right? These are people that go to work every day whose parents live near, or these her, her kids live near these plants, and they work at them every day, and they believe in the technology, and, and so, you know, ultimately, it's really about the people, and it's about making this technology available and usable for the benefit of society. So, that's my advocacy pitch. Oh, now we didn't stop here. All right, so this is, again, we're, we're new now. So, you know, nuclear's great, right? We should, I mean, if everybody listened to me, there'd be a lot more nuclear plants in the country, and obviously they're not, and, and so I want to give you the sort of the realities of, of where we are today. Um, so this, uh, this slide was put out recently by the Energy Information Administration. It's a, a, a sort of a quasi-independent part of DOE that does energy statistics and analysis. Um, this is where we are currently. The current capacity is, is 99.3 gigawatts, and this is, the, the, this is what they expect to happen between now and 2050. So they're expecting these two plants right here, these two AP1000s that are currently being built in Georgia to be built, so we'll have two new nuclear plants in this country. I think the time to completion is somewhere in the 2021-2022 time frame. Um, they are proposed. They, are, they are, are estimating that nuclear plant. You, we're going to be able to get about 3.8 additional gigawatts out of the existing plants now, just by making them more efficient, replacing steam turbines, doing other things that that generates additional power, um, putting best practice into place. Now, in in 2050, they're 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 projecting 26 gigawatts of nuclear energy lost, and those are mostly going to be older plants that, um, that are going to close, they've reached the end of their life, there is an opportunity to extend their lifetimes from 40 to 60, and again from 60 to 80, but it's, it requires a lot, and, and it requires a lot of planning, a lot of expectation that, that you're going to you know, make a profit, or at least not have to tax, or tax your, uh, your, your rate payers. Um, and so, you know, you add all this up, they expect um, roughly 80 gigawatts in 2050 in the United States. So why? Like, why is that happening? So there are a couple of different explanations. I'm not going to go into all of them tonight, but um, this, is this is a big This is not assuming a carbon tax. Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're going to go there. We're going, we're going to the, we're going to climate change. Um, in some parts of Washington, you really can't talk about it right now. It's kind of not, you know, it's volcanoes and other stuff. But, extreme uh, weather events. Ex, yeah, thank you. Extreme weather events. Um, so, I mean, this really is the story. If you look at where we are as a nation, you know, in the 60s and through the 80s, you can see this is, this is a three-year rolling average growth rate of electricity demand year over year, right? So if you reasonably, if you're here, in the, you know, the, well, let's just even say in the 2000s where we expected electricity to grow roughly at 3% a year for, for the near-term future. As, a, as an energy company or as a, um, um, as a grid operator, it creates a much different set of decisions about how am I going to, you know, what do I need to do with my generation capacity? How do I deal with retirements? How do I deal with expanded capacity? But you look at where we are now, and we're basically hovering around zero, right? And it's, it's efficiency, right? We've got a lot more LED light bulbs today. Um, it's also deindustrialization. We don't make as much here in the country. We don't, have any, we don't have as many factories operating. And because of that, we're not using as much power. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. This is, you know, this is, and we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the global section, but this kind of isn't, you know, I think we should, you know, we should be a little bit higher on this if you're, if you're an economist. This is really the true story of what's, go what's going on right now. Uh, this is natural gas prices. This is historical. You see 2000, uh, 2000, 2005, it was way up here. And back in the 90s, it was even up in here. You remember California was closing down gas plants because they couldn't afford to run them because the, the, the commodity was so high. But of course, what happened here? Fracking. Fracking, right? So, and that's changed the game, and, and if you ask people like EIA, that's the way it's going to stay for the foreseeable future. Now, I've seen EIA lines before, and they're really flat and unimaginative lines, right, which you can't blame them for it, but, 
if you look at this line here, if, if natural gas prices stay at what they call their reference case, or kind of what's most likely to happen, this is what's going to happen with nuclear generation capacity. It's going to kind of go along as, as the way we talked about it a few slides ago. We're going to begin, especially in, in the 20 to 25 uh, time period, we're going to see some plants go offline and then and gas, is, uh, gas generation is going to increase as a result. But if in, in their high resource usage um, category, if, if natural gas prices stay flat for you know, 30 years, then nuclear generation capacity is going to go down. Because remember the old capacity factor, right? Solar is at 25%, winds at 30 When those things aren't running, you got you to gotta provide power with something else. And so you're seeing a lot of coal switching to gas, but gas is going to start to eat into nuclear. Um, unless, unless we, as a country and from a policy perspective, we get serious about decarbonization and we put a price on carbon. And, and EIA did these two cases here. One is $15 a ton. The other one is $25 a ton. You know, you're not seeing any movement in the near term because there's still the new plants or some advanced reactors that we'll talk about that are coming you know, potentially coming online in the next 10 years, offer a, a, offer a lot of advantages. But obviously, if you put a price on carbon, nuclear, it becomes a favored option. So right now, in the current political environment we have, it's, it's hard to imagine the next few years there's gonna be any changes. But once we get into this time period here, right, 20, 2020 to 2025 and thereafter, it could, uh, it, you know, we, we may be in a different policy situation, which requires different energy options, which makes nuclear much more attractive. We have a good friend of ours, John Kotak, who works at the Nuclear Energy Institute, and he likes to say he's witnessed in his career, and he's about my age, he's witnessed the death of nuclear three times. And every time it comes back again because there are a new set of policy or economic circumstances <coughs> that, that and if you're interested in the policy and politics of uh, carbon generation, Columbia just came out with a study, I haven't read it yet, it's in my inbox uh, today, about uh, whether or not we're going to, what the impacts would be of uh, taxing carbon. The other thing that may impact <coughs> nuclear is whether or not we uh, electrify our, our automobile fleet. So that's another potential game changer in terms of uh, what's what we put in our cars to make them go, whether or not they, we go all electric or whether or not there's some future um, transport, transportation change that will make electricity demand go up. Mm -hmm. So this is, where we, this is where we stop. This is the flipping the coin slide, right? I've kind of done my bet. Now, uh, Joyce, it's kind of over to you to say, okay, from a, from a non-proliferation practical standpoint, um, critique my presentation. <laughs> So I'm not going to critique it. Um, so you can tell my slides are very less pretty <laughs> than Craig's slides. I do not work in PowerPoint, mostly because uh, everything that I do usually has to get approved by somebody, and PowerPoint it takes a long time. So the, the points I want to make with what Craig presented, he, he presented the case for nuclear from a very practical standpoint, right? So it is a safe technology. It is a low carbon technology. Um, depending on what happens in the future, uh, this, is, this is a good bet, right? But in the world of policy, um, and, and decisions are made by the folks who are generating the electricity as well as by those who are regulating the electricity markets, those who are regulating the nuclear power plants, and the, the folks that are in Washington that are providing the uh, incentives for which energy, for the energy mix itself. Um, so Craig talked a little bit about public perception and its <coughs> impact on policy. And he mentioned, I noticed, Three Mile Island, Fukushima, did not mention Chernobyl. I did. <laughs> uh, but mentioned the, the, the nuclear accidents that create a public perception about the safety of nuclear. And he gave, gave a counter proposal. The problem is that that, that counter-narrative has never taken foothold in the United States. Why? Because there are a lot of people who are very excited about <laughs> nuclear. They're excited about radiation and not in a good way. They don't, uh, they don't believe that we can produce electricity through nuclear generation and make it safe. Why do they think that? Well, part of this other side of the coin is 
the nuclear dilemma that's been around since the 40s, right, the 40s and 50s. When we developed nuclear energy, we also developed the nuclear weapon. And those are two sides of the same coin. And the power of the nuclear weapon, um, one, it has a power to deter, which is ostensibly why we have them. Two, it has an amazing destructive capacity, which was why we need them in World War II. Um, but they also have a psychological power over a lot of people who cannot think of nuclear, if you fill in the blank, nuclear power reactor is not what they're going to say. If you said <laughs> nuclear blank, you're going to say nuclear weapon, nuclear holocaust. And, it, and that is the mental model of most of the public. And that's one of the things that the American Nuclear Society tries to dispel about nuclear. Because I'll raise hands. Anyone ever use nuclear medicine? Yeah. Nobody thinks of that when you say nuclear. They don't think nuclear medicine. They think nuclear weapons, nuclear destruction. Um, Can I, and, and one point to that, too, because if you look at the average, back, uh, the average annual radiation exposure of an American, for the longest time it was about 350 to 400 milliram a year. Right now, it's 600 milliram a year. And why? We fly. Well, and we fly and we get scans. We get, cat, we get CT scans. We get bone scans. We, uh, running on the treadmill. Stress tests. Yeah, thank, you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, so you know, it, it's, it is amazing that in one way we fear it so much and in another way we go about actually increasing our, our exposure significantly safely, I might add, by all accounts. But, uh, but yes, to your point. So, so the images that we have about nuclear um, and, and who we allow to provide that narrative affects how society views it. And there's a lot of back, background in which uh, nuclear was secretive. And not just nuclear weapons were secretive, nuclear power plants were secretive. <coughs> You know, the Japanese took a different approach. They had, you know, had little cartoons of atoms and they had the kids go to the atomic plants to kind of walk around like it was Disneyland. We don't necessarily do that in, in this country, so people have a negative view of nuclear. Um, and so Craig's trying to help dispel those myths and obviously we want to make sure that we have an educated public, but these days it's getting harder to do that because again, perception and fact uh, are two different things and perception always outweighs fact uh, in decision making. So, so the weapons piece is a problem. The waste piece, Craig already talked about it, is, is a problem. People have this view of this huge waste problem. Well, you know what, if it was a problem, we probably would have solved it right. But if you're a, a utility, you don't mind that there's no Yucca Mountain to put your storage in. It's costing you a little bit more, particularly if you're shut down because you have to actually pay for more security. But you know, at this point, the government had promised you to take care of your nuclear waste. They didn't do it. So you're actually collecting money from the government rather than having to, to pay it. So there you have no incentive. So who, who has the incentive to take care of the waste? At this point, we've lost that incentive. So it, it becomes this dummy argument as to why nuclear is no good. And next generation reactors could, could produce even less waste than the waste we've produced so far. The only thing I'd add to that, to, to your point about the uh, the government paying for it, you know, because for that very reason the, the federal government hasn't met its obligation to take nuclear fuel, the utilities sue the government, the government now has to pay. The, the government payments to nuclear plants comprise the single largest expenditure of the federal government's judgment fund. So if it, you know, it keeps a fund, Somebody sues the federal government, the federal government has to pay, it comes out of the fund, Eight, almost $800 million a year. Um, so we're paying, you know, the irony of the, of the politics that stops it is, it hasn't stopped it because we're still paying. So. Now on the other side of that coin, um, did we handle waste poorly in the past? Oh yes, we did. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly on, so I'm on the government side. So we have the nuclear energy side of the house that, that are reactors run by utilities on the private sector. Well, the government also has a lot of facilities across the country, and particularly did uh, after the Cold War and when it still had control over the nuclear enterprise as a whole. And so out at Hanford, uh, down in Savannah River, up in New York, and other places where the Department of Energy had these facilities that were trying to um, win a war, <laughs> move very quickly, which we don't do anymore, but we try to move very quickly to uh, produce 
or choose plutonium for weapons, um, uranium for weapons, we created a lot of waste and we didn't know a lot about it. We didn't keep very good records. And we disposed of it in ways that weren't necessarily responsible. And so that's another hangover from that time period that we're still dealing with. And the Department of Energy is still responsible for cleaning it up. And that's my current job is to oversee how the Department of Energy does both their weapons work and takes care of the legacy waste from the Cold War. And, and just to give you a contrast here, so, so if you were to go to any nuclear plant, most nuclear plants have dry cask storage, right? So you have the fuel rods, they sit in the pool for five years, they put them out, put them in dry cask, stick them out on a concrete pad. You could walk around a pad, you could hug a, a, inner, you know, a, a dry cask for a long period of time, it wouldn't hurt you. <coughs> You'd look weird. But, um, <laughs> Um, but they are, you know, clean, monitored, regulated by the NRC, no moving parts. It's, it's you know, you walk around, you walk out of it as, as a technologist and you go, okay, I, f I feel pretty good about that. Go to Hanford, go to some of the, the, the tunnels that they built right after World War II with timbers and then, bear, you know, and then covered it over with dirt and now the timbers are rotting out and falling down on nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. That's the, sort of the legacy of the Manhattan Project that on one hand we had to do, but on the other hand, creates this huge cleanup burden. So when people talk about waste, it's always important to, you know, to, to it, if you can, distinguish between civilian and, and, and you know, government. Same thing with, weight, with weapons and, and, and energy, right? Two different, two sides of the same coin. Waste is different depending on what it was that you were doing to create the waste and, and how you operate in those reactors. And the, the last word, I, I wanted another W, so I said Washington. But it's the fact of the matter is that we moved nuclear into the commercial world. So the idea, since we're not a command economy, not the Soviet Union, we don't have five-year plans, we kind of let the commercial world deal with this on their own. And if you're making a decision based on your return of investment for your <coughs> shareholder, and you see that within the next five years I can make good investment, good return on my investment with natural gas, why would you build a nuclear facility that's going to cost you mo money up front uh, and charge your, you're going to have to charge your ratepayers that? So they're making, they're making an economic decision. In Washington, guns versus butter, right? The government has to make decisions about where it's going to invest its money. If they think that the industry is responsible for itself, they're not going to invest a whole lot of money there. You mentioned the um, NEUP projects, which is money that the De Department of Energy gives the universities to study these very issues, or if you look at money that the Department of Energy gives to nuclear R&D, tiny compared to the, to, the, to the large budget. Then you look at the defense budget and the de budget of the National Nuclear Security Administration who are developing new weapons, it's much, much bigger because they take the whole burden for that rather than giving it to the commercial sector which has a different incentive to do that work. And the government says, well, you, it's privatized, so let the private sector do it. So the question is, how do you want your government to be involved? Do you want your government to be involved? Do you feel like it should be a private sector decision? And then what's the responsibility and or the possibility for the government to incentivize that as a technology? And can we pick winners and losers when it comes to the technologies? And then from uh, Craig's point of view, Craig can advocate as the American Nuclear Society, but if you belong to, let's say, a nuclear lobbying group that's comprised <coughs> of executives from uh, utilities, where the utilities have coal plants and gas plants and oil plants, are you, gonna, are you going to promote nuclear by saying, nuclear clean, coal dirty? No, because you're killing part of your own business. So they don't even have a very clean no pun intended, um, lobby that can advocate for nuclear as its own thing. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I would say is, is the best thing we have going for us is generational change, right? That, that you have a whole new, and you're teaching them now, kids that didn't grow up under the Cold War, maybe don't necessarily have the same tie to weapons, you know, they didn't do duck and cover drills like we did. And, yes. um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we, uh, um, so, you know, we, I mean, I think part of the goal here is to say there are some choices coming in the future. We, you know, we are going to, as a society, need to make these choices. 
and we need to arm them with the facts in order for them to make the best choices collectively. And so that's where your role is so important. I mean, I, yeah, I would love for you to say, I want you to go out in your classroom and tell everybody we should have nuclear, and you know, maybe if it was Russia, they'd all walk out believing <laughs> it, you know, some kind of nuclear madrasa or something. But, uh, um, but we, you know, all we can do is give the facts, and, and all you can do is is provide them with the information they need to make the decision. So, and there's two generational changes, right? There's the generational changes of people, but there's also the generational change in the generation itself of electricity. Yes. This is not going to be your your granddad's reactor coming forward, if we can make that leap to the next generation technology, which hopefully won't have the same challenges, or at least the, the size of the challenges with waste, non-proliferation, which. I didn't talk about specifically, but we can talk about it later if you want to. But the two things that you need to know to build a weapon, that you need to have to build a nuclear weapon is nuclear material and the know-how. Well, the genie's out of the bottle on the know-how, so now you have to get the nuclear material. And if you have reactors, talented people, and, um, and the will, you can get there. Right. Okay, so uh, uh, let's, go, let's go to the rest of the world. This is a good segue. Um, so, I'm, as an advocate, I'm going to put up what I call the $64 trillion question, okay, which is how do, you how do you lift 2 billion people out of energy policy, uh, energy poverty, peacefully and without cooking the planet? Uh, this really is the, you know, it's the grand energy challenge that we have today. Um, and, and if we're ever going to do anything that approximates success, nuclear is going to have to be part of it. So I'm going to run you through a few slides here. The first one is, is this has been around for a while, but I think it's still relevant. So 80% of the world's population scores between, a, a scores under a 0.8 on, on the UN's Human Development Index. So this is a, a, a combination of, of, you know, uh, it's uh, infant mortality, uh, educational attainment, and then there's also, you can go to the UN website, it's sort of got three different measures, but it's basically an overall measure of your, of your affluence. And you can see here, we have a whole, you know, uh, snake bulge right here in this, you know, 03 to 06 um, area. There are a lot of people in the world that don't have enough energy to have the standard of living that they want or their kids are going to want when they grow up. And that's a huge, that's not just an energy challenge, it's also a non-proliferation challenge, a it's a larger, na it's a national security challenge. Co that's the biggest cause of human migration. Right, I mean, right, and, and then the other thing now is, is I, I've seen some numbers, crazy numbers, about a half a million people every day around the world moving into cities. And that is gonna completely change the way that we generate power and, and the way we use it. So, um, so the other thing is, and this is, I mean, this is, you know, pretty much right to the, you know, right to the trend line here. Um, energy consumption goes up as, as economic growth occurs. It happens, it's inevitable. Uh, people talk about bending the, you know, bending the curve with efficiency, but, and, and you may get a little bit, especially as, as countries get more affluent, they sort of top out on their energy use. But we have a long way to go on this line. We're gonna need a lot more energy in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so just to give you a, a sense, I mean, we sort of talked about this in the previous slide about where we are, right? So our GDP is, you know, uh, our average GDP is say 2% and we're, <coughs> our energy use is basically flat. Places like the UK, um, you know, much more aggressive conservation measures, probably of high taxes on fossil fuels, energy use continues to go down. Um, you know, Japan, I suspect a lot of this has to do with Fukushima and the fact that they shut off all of their nuclear plants. And so they, they, they found a way to make it work. They put three shifts on every factory and every few people changed their schedules around and the country rearranged itself. But that is, is you know, not every country can do it the way Japan did. Meanwhile, look at China. Uh, you know, 8% roughly on both economic growth and energy use, India the same way, Egypt, Brazil, and the chart, if you took it out to the right side, you will continue to find these countries that are becoming part of the global economy 
and, and their energy growth is going to grow very quickly. They are making, those people are making the energy choices that we made 20 or 30 years ago because they're looking at a demand curve that goes up. Uh, and again here, you know, sort of represented in a slightly different way. These are the projections for GDP and uh, electricity use going forward. Here's your OECD, right, your developed world. You know, we're going we're gonna, to um, uh, moderately grow our, our GDP in the next 30 years, moderately grow our energy use, but again, we've topped out, right? If you think about that line, we're, we're, um, we, don't, we, we, we sort of have all the energy we need right now. Whereas the non-OECD world, again, major economic growth, you know, you're talking about, uh, um, you know, the doubling of economic growth in the developing world. Uh, and energy use uh, is, is going to double as well, uh, or, or somewhere close to that. Uh, and, and look, guys, if you think it's coming from shale gas, it's not around the world because, you know, here's our, here's our shale gas. This is mostly America. Um, you know, the non-OECD shale, just, you know, the, a lot, you know, you just don't have the geologic formations for it. You don't have the, um, the, the standards of law in place. You know, it, this, this chart is a snapshot in time and it could change a couple of years from now. But right now, you know, energy economists are not expecting the shale gale that happened in the U.S. to fundamentally, you know, change the way that energy is provided in other parts of the world. Uh, okay, and now I'm going to go into full advocacy mode because the thing you have to be careful about is, is doing it wrong, okay? And Germans, yeah, you talk to a lot of them who they, they just don't like nuclear. They've never liked nuclear. But it, it's, it's important to say what does a future without nuclear look like and how do we, and how do we judge it. Um, so their goals set about 20 years ago, one-third renewables, 40% CO2 reduction by 2020, nuclear phase out by 2022. Um, they've invested $800 billion in solar, wind, every kind of renewable energy technology you can imagine, uh, transmission lines, distributed generation. I mean, you know, the Germans, and they've got the money to do it, and they're pouring it into their country. Their electricity prices now, residential, are three times higher than the United States. Um, they have a negligible decrease in per capita CO2 emissions, mostly because they throw so many intermittent sources on the grid that you know they're buying gas from Russia, as Donald Trump will tell you. But uh, they're um, also built, burning lignite coal. They're burning lignite coal the to make up the difference. Yeah. It's like the dirtiest form of coal because they have no other energy source. And in addition, they also import a lot of nuclear from France, right? So they kind of get the you know they get the little bit of the benefit from that. So over time, they've had really a negligible decrease in per capita CO2 emissions over that 20-year period because of the choices they've made. Yeah. So there's a way to do it right, and there's a way to do it wrong. And you know, Germans may like artisan energy the way we, you know, you might buy a bagel in Brooklyn, but you know, it's it's, and they might be able to afford it. But is it the best way for everyone to go? I don't think so. Um, and then there's the there's the you know the challenge of deep decarbonization. So if you think about, you know, so let's just say we want to address the climate problem. What do we have to do in order to do it? This is uh, from a report called Deep Decarbonization Pathways. It was a fairly, uh, uh, you know, landmark study. We looked at every individual country and what they might be able to do based upon their, their domestic generation mix, their natural resources. This is America's here. Um, you know, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, you've got a little bit of efficiency, a little bit of smart growth, which I think is is uh, code for decreased economic growth. Um, you know, you have a oops, you have a little bit of uh, laser button. Um, you know, you have a lot of, of renewable energy generation here. You have fuel switching from like coal to gas, uh, power to gas, which is small, but it's interesting. It's harvesting wind energy during the day by making hydrogen and then using it some other way. Um, you know, there is a huge, you know, you can, I don't have the, the charts for nuclear in this case, but they're significantly larger. We're not in a policy position to do this yet, but if we ever want to get serious about carbon in this country, it's going to require major changes. So this is my little thought experiment. Okay, so let's, you know, you can make any kind of, of projection that you want. So I'm going to make mine as an advocate. 
Um, so if you look at, I've, so I've done everything now. Now, if there's anything wrong with this, please let me know. I've run it by several people that are electrical engineers and, and, and they've given this, you know, and, and you people online too, if you see anything wrong with this, let me know. But, you know, we've converted everything to uh, exajoules. Um, this is where we are today, currently in terms of primary energy use in the world. Uh, 709 is where we need to be if we're just going to go flat on energy consumption. We're going to ignore that GDP, um, uh, that GDP energy consumption trend line. Um, if we wanted to give everyone as much energy as we have here, we basically have to have used six times the energy that we're doing now in the world. Probably unlikely. Um, and then, you know, I put this one in the middle, which is if you just take the historical trend and make it a per capita equivalent, we're going to need about 925, which is basically the energy consumption per capita of a country like Bulgaria. So not, you know, okay, but a little cold, right? So they got to heat their homes. And so we take that number. Now you take that difference between that 400, ex that 400 exajoules that we need, and then say we're going to make 9% nuclear. So 9% of the United States energy uh, um, uh, energy primary energy generation is nuclear so let's just kind of use that right we're not going to go France we're not going to go you know any of the countries that have really bet on nuclear but we're just going to kind of say we're going to take a developing world's share of energy for nuclear um, you can see the numbers here 36 exajoules uh, you know you need 10,000 10, terawatts of installed capacity assuming an 80% capacity factor you can come up with some really kooky numbers just by putting reasonable inputs into the calculation, that we need a lot of nuclear plants. Uh, and whether they're big ones or whether they're small ones, and we'll talk about the technology in a bit, I'm not saying this is gonna happen. All I'm saying is, in a responsible world where we are lifting people out of poverty and we are reducing carbon, this is not an unreasonable scenario. So um, it would be a real shame not to do something like this because we have a fear that's not fully informed by the science. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, so that so you heard is two goals, right? Lift people out of poverty and address climate change. So first we have to get the world to agree on those two goals, and then you have to get them to agree on the solution set. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not you know, realist. I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> Look, I, I get it, but I just you know. All right. So here's a, re here's, a, here's a more realistic graph, right? This is, this is Exxon, BP, Exxon, all the major energy companies all do their annual outlook, right, that sort of informs their, their shareholders and what they're seeing and informs their strategy. So this is what they expect nuclear to be. This is where they were in 2014. This is what they expect to be in 2040. Wind and solar, big increases, right? We're gonna blow it out on wind and solar globally. Um, in, in the next uh, 20 or so 20 years. But look at these dash lines down here. Thank oh, you, Joyce. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. That's the, effective, that's the effective utilization. So this is capacity plus capacity factor, right? Now, if you take the difference between what we're going to actually get in electrons from wind and what we're actually going to get from solar and you stack them up, they're pretty much kind of like what we're going to get out of nuclear in the next 20 years, right? So again, it gets back to that capacity issue, right? We, we you know, the, the, the advocates in the renewable energy industry always love to, you know, do this one. It's going to grow eight times. Well, you know, it's only half the story, so. And, and, and the reality check is, however, the cost per unit is less for the solar and wind. Is less for the wind and solar. Correct. But, but, but the investment cost, we'll just, we'll just say the investment cost. The investment cost is less. I can invest in 10 solar companies, one of them so works, I win. Yeah. I can invest in one nuclear company, because I can't invest in 10, because there's just no money. So we're gonna get to new technology in a second, because we're trying to break that. But that's right, it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate challenge, right? The challenge of nuclear is you know, going to your shareholders and going to your lawyers and say, let's go do this. Right? Oh, because and finding somebody on Wall Street that's going to coax the capital off the sidelines to invest. Right. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. I know, I know, I know, but, you know, stay hopeful. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so this is, this is the slide. So now we actually, we, we sort of lurched uncontrollably into this slide, right? <laughs> so, so, Joyce, 
Break it down. So, so, so part of so Craig talked about the the global generation. Who's gonna? Who's going to? Who has the technology capacity to bring that technology? And where are you going to bring it? Right? Are you going to? Sub-Saharan Africa are the places that are going to be looking to increase electricity mm -hmm. generation. They need to, to increase electricity generation because they are not, they are in electricity poverty right now. Uh, how do they do that? It's complicated because they're not going to do it the way we did. Hopefully, they're not going to develop the way we did, which was you know coal to oil, gas to get to gas to nuclear. They're going to leapfrog just the way they did on you know they don't have transmission lines for telephones, they have cell phones. They don't go to banks, they do their banking on their cell phones. So they know, we know that that's what's gonna happen, they're gonna leapfrog, but how, who is gonna be in the position to help them make that transition? So, so this is where the geopolitics comes into line and, and Craig and I have had many discussions about, about our nuclear industry and their role in the world. And so that's kind of how I uh, pegged this slide versus uh, the actual, need, which is what Craig outlined. Mm -hmm. The need is going to be there. Uh, the challenge is going to be who will pay for it, uh, who's going to develop it, and who's going to be willing to take it. So when, when we look at what our policies are as the U.S. government, these are the types of things that we have to take into consideration. So foreign policy, we take into consideration geopolitics, nonproliferation, climate. I will tell you when we went into um, the Paris Agreement, and they were having all those conversations in the Obama administration. I was the woman in the room saying, and nuclear, and nuclear. They were all thinking wind, solar, biomass, tidal. Um, they weren't thinking nuclear uh, because they have also that natural bias against nuclear. So this is another bias, public perception that you have to fight is that nuclear isn't green. Um, so we got to kind of get them into that mindset. The nonproliferation challenge is that there are people on the left and on the far right who don't believe that we should be helping other countries in the nuclear space because it will lead to proliferation of nuclear weapons. So why do they think that? Well, historically, you know, India's remember her peaceful use detonation of a nuclear weapon of a nuclear detonation. Um, that came from a peaceful uses program where they were using a candy reactor from Canada, took the material, developed a weapons program. Um, we are concerned about other nations taking the, the technologies and misusing them for, for other than peaceful purposes. We have international organizations that look at those things, International Atomic Energy Agency, and try to help countries harness the benefits of nuclear energy, but there is always this tension when it comes to nuclear weapons, nonproliferation, and nuclear power generation. And then geopolitics come into place because, you know, there are some countries with whom we do business, and there are some countries with whom we don't do business, and it, and it depends, right? So you all know, you know, North Korea, not likely to be sharing nuclear technology with them anytime soon. Um, but there's also issues of sanctions, China, those AP-1000s he talked about as your, as your base example of a nuclear power reactor, we're building two in Georgia, but we built two in four units, two, mm -hmm. two sites in China already. Well, that was actually not an easy lift in the administration. The administration was a little bit easier, but on the Hill, because there was a lot of, there were a lot of challenges to the fact that they were worried that China was going to appropriate our intellectual property. This is the discussion about, one of the discussions about the tariffs, is how do you combat losing of intellectual property? Westinghouse wanted to go in and make the deal with China as a private company, and they actually signed away a lot of their intellectual property. Why? Because they wanted to be able to build the plant, to prove they could build a plant in China with the market that would allow them to do that. So they took, they, they you know, took a calculated risk and said, okay, well, we're gonna go build, they're still going to want Westinghouse, but that technology has been, some of that technology has been appropriated to China, and now China has that capacity, that technology, and they're going to want to export in competition with us, and probably can do it cheaper. So the question is, if you're a country buying a nuclear power plant, 
Are you going to buy from China, which is cheaper? Or are you going to buy from the U.S., which you think is safer? Well, they do that cost-benefit analysis to determine which one that they're going to want to do. And until we can drive our prices down to be competitive, or until we have the mechanisms in place to provide the, I forget the 10-minute sign, <laughs> until we get the mechanisms in place to help them with the financing, uh, we might be out of luck. And, and that then sort of begs the question, right? Because we're going to, if, if you assume that we're already developing in non-OECD countries, then, you know, how do we want that development to occur? And, and what kind of technology do we want to use? And what, what should those regulatory barriers be? And that gets to the heart of this sort of non-proliferation question of, and the way I've always defined it is, is it, you know, do we have a policy of control? or do we try to have a policy of influence? But it's, it's also more than that. What does the government want to do vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? One, one way we look at them is as a market. So, so Craig's looking at it from the point of view of a market for US technology, which will then help our industry domestically, right? But you also have to decide whether or not you're in it to raise people out of poverty. Because you're going to do things a little bit differently if that's the case. And you might use government money to invest in R&D. And you might want to invest in R&D for a power plant that is grid appropriate to these other countries so that you can export. So there's the profit motivation, but then there's the altruistic motivation. And the question is, what do you define as altruistic? If you want to lift people out of poverty, you don't necessarily do that out of the goodness of your heart. People who are in poverty tend to flee the countries from which they're living, they tend to have more conflict, and that actually impacts national security. So, but that's a far thinking way of looking at policy, and depending on who's making those decisions, uh, they have to be able to take those into consideration. So let's go, I know we're, we're a little short on time, I'm gonna whip through these last few slides and hopefully have some time for questions. Um, okay, so I want to show you a couple of, you know, we talk a lot about new technology that's out there, right? So I just want to do a, a quick whirlwind tour of some of the technologies that are available. This is the new scale power module here. Jose Reyes is the former chair of nuclear engineering for Oregon State University and is now the chief technology officer, I believe, for new scale. This is a 50 megawatt reactor. So if you think about, if you think about, uh, the Westinghouse reactor, you're talking about 1 20th of the size. But this actually, very few moving parts, much more simple design. Scalable. Scalable. It has, uh, uh, you know, the, your thermal hydraulics, basically. It, it, it does away with the need for a lot of pumps. Most notably, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided earlier this year that it is technically what I'm going to call walk-away safe. In other words, you can basically lock the control room wherever this is, and it's going to, you know, you're, you're not going to have a Fukushima-like accident with it because the whole thing sits in water. So it's, it's basically sitting in its own ultimate heat sink. Um, Bill Gates investing heavily in a company called TerraPower. TerraPower is, is developing a number of reactors, but the one they're most known for is the traveling wave reactor. The theory behind this is that you use a fast reactor where you can actually capture more of the energy content in the fuel you're using and that the cores are very long lived. So if you think of a, a regular nuclear plant, they're, they're reshuffling and refueling every 24 months. Hypothetically, you can, well, you can really push those fuel cycles out to 5, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, sometimes longer if the, if the technology allows for it. Think about what that does, reduces the flow of materials, addresses some of, of Joyce's concerns about having a lot of flow of materials out there in the world. They're building it in China. Sadly, um, but necessarily. Uh, molten salt reactors, here the, the, the actual, the actinides are in the, uh, um, are in the coolant itself, and so they get, they get taken on and taken off uh, offline. Very, operates at atmospheric temperatures. So, you know, if you think about pressure, you know, most uh, PWRs now are at five or 6,000 PSI, they operate, you know, you're talking about atmospheric pressure here, so no, you know, no, no uh, pressure explosions. Um, 
again, you know, some non-proliferation issues to discuss. If you've got the fuel in there, you've got to make sure that every actinide you take out is accounted for in some way so somebody doesn't take the, the waste cart, you know, through a hidden door. But, uh, you know, in this era of safeguards by design and remote monitoring, uh, definitely possible a lot of investment going into this type of reactive technology. Terrestrial is one company. There are several others out there doing the same. And then the, the, uh, the idea of nuclear batteries or micro reactors for, for remote locations. This is the Westinghouse E. Vinci reactor concept where one, one, you know, one potentially two megawatts of power, hardly any moving parts, in, in, in extremely simple device. Um, with a relatively long uh, fuel ratio. But you can kind of see where, where you can use these, you know, even, if there's some places now where even where, with natural gas prices, where in Alaska, you have all these communities that basically power their energy systems with diesel oil that's either trucked in or flown in or, or barged in. And these are in various stages of development. Some are more paper designs. Yeah. Some have issues still with fuel quieting and other issues. But we have, we have good pictures for all of them. We have good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Sales pitches. And then finally, fusion, right? I mean, this is, you know, the old joke about fusion is it doesn't matter what year you ask, it's only 50 years away. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are some companies that, that are actually investing in some unique uh, fusion uh, um, possibilities. So there's a lot of technology out there on the horizon that can help us, but we, we have to continue to develop it, and we have to, you know, we have to have a system that allows us to deploy those things on a time scale that makes sense for the financial markets, and that's that. Real, that truly is the grand challenge. Um, getting back to just real quick, a couple of other points. Getting back to just where we where we are. If you look at back in the 1970s, we were still supplying the world with 60% of all the reactors. Right? We had a controlling, we had a dominant position in the market. This is basically where we are now. Right? The Russians, the Chinese, the Koreans, the you know. There are a number of other countries out there that are aggressively moving into new parts of the world selling reactors. Um, you know, this is a non-proliferation issue. Too bad we don't have that much time to talk about it now. But, uh, to, but to yeah. this slide, I think another report online that just came out today, CSAS did a, uh, did a report. Um, you know, it used to be in the Obama administration, nuclear advocates would say it's nuclear energy for climate change. This one's nuclear energy for security. You know, we just... Both things are true, but the emphasis is on a, is on a different syllable depending on who's in the way. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it, it represented in a different way. Um, there's a lot of Russia on this map right now. Russia is very aggressive in selling their technology. Um, I mean, these, and there's a reason for that. We can get into it. We can, um, but we're. I know no, we're. Go ahead. I like your deal. Okay, <laughs> you sure? Because I got the five minute. Yeah, I, have, I have to actually ask for the future. Are you guys okay to do more than five more minutes or fifteen? Yeah. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go five. Well, we got prime time. This is, yeah. It's like going to the movies. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, again, this is where, you know, there's this balance, right? On the one hand, any, any non-weapon state in, in the world that signed the, nu the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is essentially entitled to the peaceful uses of nuclear technology, right? So, now, you know, there are ways in which you can argue if something is civilian or not, right? I mean, go and look at Iran, and that will help you, you know, if you've got one guy who's got, you know, one arm that's really skinny because he only has two reactors, and then he's got a whole bunch of enrichment capacity on this arm, you got to wonder that that's a bit strange. But, uh, um, but there, is, there is an argument for the U.S. to, to remain engaged yeah. in the world. So let me, let me talk about competitiveness of the U.S. overseas, because this was my job for three years, and, and it was frustrating. Um, so part of it is actually not the government. It's not that the government has just decided that we don't want to export nuclear reactor technologies because of non-proliferation. That's really not the story. Um, part of the story is that it started with, you know, France, Inc. Um, they kind of fell off. But China and Russia in particular, they have a different way of doing business in the world, and they want to project power through economics, right? So they, they to go to the developing countries, and they, they develop. They put in roads. They put in, you know, they, they have lost leads. But they're doing that on the reactors, too. They also have large vertical integrated companies. We have a lot of reactor technologies. Westinghouse, GE-ish. Uh, some of those companies will come out and say, well, I have a reactor technology. Would you like to buy it? 
that's all they have is the reactor technology. They don't have the company that's actually going to build it. They don't have, you know, they may have the fuel to supply it, but they're not going to give you a soup to nuts, um, fixed price meal. They're going to be doing, it's a la carte when it's with America. The Russians do build, own, operate, and finance. Right. I mean, you you get the whole thing. It's it's like going right. to the Ford dealer at the end of the month, right? They'll you know, and, no and money the, down. And the Chinese can do the same thing, and they're government backed. Now, our government advocates for our nuclear companies overseas. We have an advocacy program, so that at any level of the government, an undersecretary, assistant secretary, a secretary, the president himself, I will say himself because that's always that way. Sorry, himself will go and advocate for nuclear, for one of our nuclear companies if they're in a bid overseas. But what we don't do is we don't link it to a bunch of other things. You buy my reactor, we'll throw in a few fancy jets, you know, that type of thing. We, we don't do that. We advocate for our companies based on our companies. And we don't control the companies, right? So we can't tell the companies, you really ought to make that 20% cheaper and then they'll buy it and then you can demonstrate to everybody else that you can build on time and that your product is good. We can't dictate to that to the companies. Nobody would want us to. So our companies are at this competitive disadvantage. However, our competitive advantage yet is we have 99 operating nuclear reactors. With the exception of the, the challenge we had at Three Mile Island, we have one of the safest records in the world. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is seen as gold standard in the rest of the world in terms of its capabilities to regulate nuclear reactors. Those countries want to come and train at our Nuclear Regulatory Commission to learn how to regulate those reactors. Because again, a reactor is not the type of thing that you drop off and say, good luck with that, you know, we're done. It's an 80-year relationship, 80 to 100-year relationship with that country. Because you are going in, you're helping them with the regulations, you're building the reactor, the reactor is operating, it's a you're supplying the fuel. It's a long-term relationship. China and Russia have a little bit longer viewpoint than A, some of our companies, and B, our government. And don't forget, we operate as a government on year-to-year -year <coughs> budget appropriations, or most likely continual resolutions, because we can't seem to get a budget passed. And so we're also constrained by those realities in Washington. Well, I, I, I sort of just end on that end on that point because I think it's 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 the right one to end on, which is this is about having a long-term view. When you're talking about climate change, you're talking about about lifting people out of poverty, preventing proliferation, you've got to think long term. And when you do, nuclear makes a lot of sense. If we're thinking about it in the way that we buy a Slurpee, it's not going to. But I will tell you, at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, we as a country and we as individuals will be worse off as a result. So, you know, I guess I would just end by obviously thanking you on behalf of both of us for your time. Um, wish you the best of luck in, in you know, teaching a new generation of people that will hopefully fix the things that we've screwed up and will maybe take a little bit different view of the world. And um, I don't, do we have time for questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, uh, but, but I'll, we'll sort of end the... Oh. I have one more. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, end on, I'm gonna end on this no, actually, one. Why don't you put my slide up, that way I've got questions on That one? Yeah. Okay. Because this is just a... So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Sir. All right, so back to your, your projection slide where you're like, okay, with the Indiana oil prices, it might go up this mm -hmm. much, might go down this much. Uh, were, were you guys, uh, when you make those projections, do you include um, like other technolo uh, technology and development and things like that? Like, for example, uh, uh, greater solar cell efficiencies or, or battery tech or anything like that? Is that, is that yeah. being taken into consideration? So, so um, you know, the EIA does look at those factors when they make their projections. I mean, you, you raised a, uh, an interesting one, which is sort of energy storage and, and, and specifically grid scale energy storage, because mm -hmm. you're seeing the prices come down a lot on that. And, and I think that you, will, that you will see an EIA is assuming that you'll see greater use of that. But if you simply look at the scale of energy production that we have today, and if you're trying to integrate high levels of intermittent resources onto the grid, 
and address for seasonal changes, right? Like so right now, the grid scale storage is good if you've got wind in West Texas at 2 a.m. in the morning and you can feed that back out to the grid at, at 12 o'clock the next day on a 100 degree day, that it makes sense. But if you're, if you're talking about what if we have seven days where there's no wind, but it's been cloudy, it, storage is a long, you know, is a long way away from that. No matter what people will tell you in terms of, don't worry, we can go 100% renewable. It's but, just but, but batteries could be a game changer in what I said earlier too. Is if we go to electrify the uh, transportation sector, mm -hmm. and so they might actually um, balance each other out a little bit more in terms right. of what the the demand is going for. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm old enough to remember the high school when I got my license and gas went up from whatever it was, 50, 70 cents to $1.50 and we waited in line. Yep. Based on, on your license plate. Only on certain uh, days. Yeah, yeah. I had a gas waiting in line as a high school kid. <laughs> <laughs> he was excited, not empty. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, that kind of, I'm wondering, I heard today another speaker say that 40% of Virginia's power, if it's an accurate figure, was on nuclear. So yeah. part of it seems to be just awareness. It's already out there, it, it's maybe we don't realize it, and then I'm wondering to what degree is it going to be our pocket, our pocketbooks? Because when the prices go up, the K cars came out, and we, and we mm -hmm. yeah. the cars went small, mm -hmm. and Japan had a better car, and they, mm -hmm. I mean, so what are the four, how do those forces come into play of it all? Because we don't, it, it seems kind of distant, we don't realize that right. we're using them, it doesn't hit our pocketbooks, so we're not incentivized to change our things. So let me let me take a quick shot, and then, okay. and then, um, so, um. You know, part of the slides that I showed you before that show you the, the natural gas prices and what the expectations are domestically for the next 20 to 25 years. So that suggests that, you know, that the, the price volatility of natural gas and fossil fuels that we've seen in the past isn't going to happen in the future, right? There, so, so what the experts are saying is no way. I mean, it's, it's you know, we're, we're distributed production now. We can, you know, we're... We're not seeing it, you know, a lot of fall off in wells. We think this is going to go for, for some period of time. Now, you know, maybe, right? Now, I mean, you know, they said the same thing about housing prices in the last decade, and we all know what happened there, right? So don't discount the, the sort of the black swan effect of believing that, oh, it's different this time. But there seems to be some consensus that there is, which makes it more difficult. Well, we suck at predicting. We'll just say that. Yeah. Because, I mean, at one point we said, oh, nuclear is going to be too cheap to meet it didn't happen, remember? Mm -hmm. um, but I would also say that, again, if there is a move toward carbon pricing, um, then then you will see necessarily a market shift. Um, right now, the debate is about how do you factor in the externalities of reliability of, of the resource. Um, so, so the nuclear advocates will say, we are 24-7, doesn't matter if the wind's blowing, doesn't matter if the Base sun's load. shining, we're baseload, we can, um, you know, your chemical factory can run on nuclear, it's not gonna run on wind. And there's no way for the market to adjust for that, right? And so, so there's moves to see whether or not we can get the governments uh, within states to take that into consideration. So that's also, so, so there are other externalities that could come into play, but carbon pricing would be one of them, I would say, predictability is not. But when it comes to Virginia, look, I, I live in Virginia, I'll tell you that you, your average Virginian does not know where his or her electricity comes from. I've seen them protest those pipelines. They're protesting all the natural gas pipelines. And so I'm like, right, so we could use nuclear, which is a much safer energy form. And the people who are protesting the pipeline look at me like I have six heads because they're like, why would you want nuclear? I'm like, well, it's like Anna, have you been there? Like, nice warm water lake? <laughs> they don't know. And I think if they did know, they'd be kind of unhappy about it. Um, plus, we're in a weird situation in Virginia. I know you probably get Dominion coming in here. Uh, in in that, let's just say they're not necessarily the most popular um, utility <laughs> moment in the Commonwealth. Welcome to Dominion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think ultimately, look, you you know, there are a number of different ways to achieve a clean, reliable. Right, renewables clearly. I mean, solar with sort of its load following ability has a lot of you know uh, a lot of potential for for peak times. But you know, if you put a bunch of engineers in the room and said design a power plant, uh, a, a, an electricity system 
that is highly reliable, you know, low cost and low volatility. So you, it's, you know, the cost is predictable. Nuclear would be part of it, right? But it's not engineers. We have grids where people can plug in whatever energy generation machine they have and try to do a market play based on what they see and how much subsidies they might get back from the government and, and so forth. Also, so we have a different world. It also depends on where your pipelines are, yeah. where you are in the United States. You right. know, New England, we all have uh, home heating oil because that's, right. that's what we have our options for. Sorry. I had read uh, recently that the UK is, is decommissioning a dozen Magnox uh, sites and um, they hadn't priced in the decommissioning costs and now the UK taxpayers can, I think it's like eight and a half billion dollars or something to, to clean up those sites. Um, how, how is that handled in the US? Is, is, is that cost priced into the, to the, like is there a fund that, yeah, that exactly. actually feeds that? Or? So there's a decommissioning fund per reactor um, that the reactor is the utility is responsible for. So if it has one reactor or ten reactor, each one of those reactors has a certain decommissioning cost. Now we haven't actually gotten into large scale decommissioning in the United States yet. Um, it's coming. Right? Yeah. It's coming. It's Growth industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyone who you know encourage your students that this is actually a good good thing for them to go into because there'll there'll be a lot of decommissioning that has to go to go forward over time, and it's a great it's a great. Uh, Career but it's, it's done before. It's fairly standard in the way that it's handled. You're yeah. not talking about one-off situations like you would be with defense waste. Right. They do put money away into a, de into a decommissioning fund, the companies do, so that when the plant closes down, they access that money. It's already built. And, and the waste storage technically is built. So Yucca Mountain and where the federal government is supposed to take back the waste, up until a couple of years ago, there was a 1.8 mil per kilowatt hour charge on everybody's electricity bill that would take care of the back end of the waste. So it's designed to be part of, you know, built into the cost of generation. Unfortunately, the policy side of it has been more and, and challenging. That, the, you know, the new reactors are, are looking at um, kind of safeguards by design, safety by design, security by design. They're also hopefully looking at dec decommissioning by design because some of the earlier things that we did, we didn't think about how we take it apart later on. Uh, so hopefully that means that the decommissioning costs on future reactors would be less if right. they design them correctly. And we will cover that on Thursday on the back end of nuclear waste and materials. So that's my area. So um, we'll talk about that. Then we'll have on Saturday on talking about future reactor as well. Mm -hmm. Right off the kind of party. So. Mm -hmm. any, any more questions? One for the road. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, one of the newer um, techs you mentioned was a molten salt reactor. Was that originally a thorium reactor design? Yes, and, and yes it was. Is, is thorium is still in consideration by any group seriously? Because with, with thorium, you, don't you avoid the um, proliferation? So the question is on thorium and, <laughs> and molten salt reactors. So I'm going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be, um, I'm a, so there are a lot of, there are a lot of people and a lot of engineers that are really excited about the thorium fuel cycle because it does um, uh, it does require you know there, there are certain things it could do differently. Now the reality of this is our our you know we are trapped in the QWERTY keyboard of uranium. Okay, so the whole supply chain is designed to support uranium. We understand the mining; everything is there. All the business risk is identified. You know, the idea of going to thorium, while possible, is is you know, in my view, unlikely in the in the near term. And you can speak to the proliferation side. Yeah, I, I'll just if you don't get rid of that, and it has some very nasty byproducts that are hard to handle. Um, I would say that the India is probably the most advanced when it mm -hmm. comes to looking at thorium reactors because they don't have a lot of uranium, so they want to have kind of an indigenous fuel source within India, so they've got a lot of work to be done on that. So in the past, also we'll cover that in also in the back end of nuclear fuel cycle because thorium is part of consideration because typically the byproduct of thorium has uranium-233 and uranium-232, which is quite nasty. So during that time, Thorax was actually developed by Oak Ridge National Lab, has some problem with it due to the cost. And it's, it's actually come monumentally. But if you ignore the cost and safety, 
And we're talking about the capacity of the source. In this particular, in this particularly, India is one of the highest thorium stores, and therefore they want to have that. And U.S. right now, if I'm correct, they're in the fifth ranking of the source of thorium. Surprisingly, thorium is very bad source in also in Virginia, and also in Idaho, and also very close border of Canada. So that's why you've seen a lot of national laboratory and all this stuff being built that that way. It's just because we have thorium source, but as compared to India, it's not that much. But we'll discuss about that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Let's see that I can close this. Finish. Thank you. I don't know if you're right. It's 8.50.